report on this computer. All right, uh, Sharon, you are mm -hmm. over on the holy side of the border right now, but you live in Ternopil, right? That is correct, yes. But you don't have a classic uh, Slavic accent. So <laughs> does your husband explain, explain how this happens about your family? Well, we are a typical marriage made in YWAM. So I uh, did my DTS back in 1996 and our outreach came to Ukraine and the interpreter that had been sent to meet our team and to take us to his hometown of Lutsk is the man that I've now been married to for almost 21 years. <laughs> so he, he actually came to the Lord through a crossroads uh, outreach um, in 1994. And then he would translate for all the teams that came in previous yeah, years. So. Terrific. He so married what, so in what's 2000 his name? And his what? name is Ruslan. Ruslan. Uh, Ruslan Baradin. And uh, we married in 2001 and, and helped pioneer the base actually in Simferopol, Crimea in 2003. And then have, um, since the invasion and occupation of Crimea, we have found ourselves repositioned to Ternopil for the last eight years. Well, tell me a little bit about that time with, with Russia uh, taking over Crimea and the rest, the rest of the world saying, don't do that. Oh, we're mm -hmm. sorry you did that. <laughs> that. That was about all. Did it feel that way to you? No, not at all. It was, um, up until that moment, it was the greatest tragedy of our lives because in a day we lost our community, we lost all the momentum of the ministry that we had been building there. And ultimately we lost our home. Um, so yeah, it was, uh, um, yeah, even eight years later, it's still hard to find the words to express yeah. what that was like, but it was, you know, like what you see in the movies, we woke up, um, first reports coming in that the parliament building that was just six, six blocks from our house had been taken by unmarked special operations soldiers and, so my husband had put me and our two daughters, who were then uh, six and eight, on the train heading to Ternopil. Yeah. And so we, our, our train was the last train to leave. And um, after our train left, the whole, the whole peninsula was, was locked down by what we now know to have been Russian yeah. soldiers. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, and now it's, it's happening again, huh? It's happening again. Yeah. Yes. And how did you feel at that time you and your husband uh, about the response of western nations and as, as a committed mm -hmm. christian what you know what are your thought process do you do you have conflicting thoughts about what what the west should do uh, as a as a christian and you know love your enemies sure. and all that what, what, what were you thinking then and and mm -hmm. is it the same you're thinking now yeah you know, our situation was very interesting. So um, my husband is from Western Ukraine, but he was raised in a Russian speaking family. Okay. Um, so our family is Russian speaking, um, but we also have, you know, I'm from the United States, was born and raised in uh, Washington state in Northern Idaho. So in 2014, when all, you know, when suddenly everybody was watching our, our, our area on the on the front page of all the newspapers and on all the television sets, we were looking at news coming out of Russia, coming out of Ukraine, coming yeah. out of Europe, coming out of America. And, and, you know, all those years, all these years later, the one thing that really sticks out into my mind is what wasn't covered in, in the worldwide news agencies. And, you know, uh, Russia tried to make everything look like it was very legal. They had this election where they reported that 99% of the population yeah. voted for Crimea to become part of Russia. And the reality was that on the ballot, there were two choices to become their own separate, um, you know, breakaway location or to become part of the, of, uh, the Federation of Russia. There was no option to, to stay as part of Ukraine. So so that part of the population didn't even come to vote. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and so, you know, of course, this was not reported in the news. And it was reported that 99% of the population was for um, being annexed by Russia. Yeah. And even, even the so Western felt, press said that, didn't they? So what, what around the world? So. Yeah. 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 And the, the, the reality was this, this was horrible. It tore up families. It was very politicized. So even in our, even in our home churches, you know, you had the Russians versus the Ukrainians in terms of, oh of how they saw the situation politically. You had families who were excited about, you know, becoming part of Russia and you had families that were, that just mm. thought it was the most evil, awful thing. And, 
And we saw churches split up over this. We saw families split up over this. Um, and, and so much propaganda. We, we ended up going to Teranopol. And in those days, um, the propaganda was saying that Western Ukraine was full of um, Nazis and these yeah. Bandera people. And, yeah. you know, if you spoke Russian there, they beat you up. And, of course, when we arrived as some of the first displaced people from the conflict in Crimea, we were, and I, and I speak Russian, I didn't speak any Ukrainian at that time. We were welcomed. Um, yeah. The house, our neighbors of the house we rented, as soon as they found out we were from Crimea, they brought us, you know, eggs from their chickens, canned preserves. I mean, they just adopted us, loved us, helped us settle in. And Isn't that terrific? Uh, how, 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 how different are the two languages? Um, I tell people it's a little bit like Spanish and Portuguese. Yeah. So, okay. yeah, so many words are exactly the same. The gr grammar is similar, but then there are words that are completely different. So. Right, right. So you've been on a learning curve, and I guess that curve is behind you now, and you've got pretty good Ukrainian and good Russian. Yes. And do you still yes. speak Russian at home? We do. And, and I would say our, the, the language, uh, the dominant language for our family is Russian. Um, I understand Ukrainian now conversationally, and I can, you know, I throw in some Ukrainian words in my sentence structure. But, but you know, in Russian, I, I am fluent. Uh, my Ukrainian is like preschool level if I try to speak right, it. So. Right, okay. Mm -hmm. Are enough enough people speak uh, Ukraine or Russian there that you get on okay with Russian and English? Well, the reality is that the vast majority of the refugees that are coming in from Ukraine, they are all from the Russian speaking parts of Ukraine. Right. So the right. so the dominant language that is needed here is actually Russian. And right. and it's also a great irony of this awful war is that Russia has attacked the part of Ukraine that was very pro Russia. Yeah, um, they yeah. attacked the part of Ukraine that politically felt closer, you know, culturally and otherwise to Russia. And so in many ways, you know, Russia succeeded in alienated even even more of the people of Ukraine um, you, that might have felt closer to the Russian culture and politics. And do you do you think that that is uh, will hold true? Do you think this is pretty much uh, determined or created determination in the, in the minds of the people in the East that they will not be absorbed into, into Russia? Oh, yes, I think so. Yeah. I mean, you're always, you know, there is a battle. This, you know, there is an mm -hmm. enemy and the enemy has flesh and blood and the enemy is in the spiritual realm and is definitely has, um, is, is working through propaganda and just keeping people blind. And yeah. I know people, that is true about here in Ukraine as well as in Russia. But, but Russia has come um, ruthlessly and Russia has come with no respect of, of child, woman, grandmother, grandfather. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and people have lost everything that you could lose that was precious to them in a horrible way. Yeah. And so in doing that, Russia has become the enemy. Whether yeah. And so that is devastating no matter what you felt, but it, I think it's especially devastating if your, if your um, cultural identity felt closer to, yeah. to the Russian people. So it is very heartbreaking. And the report that I reported to a lot of people this morning, the one that comes out from Al Akimov via Lorna mm -hmm. Darling's office, um, they quoted a, a grandmother saying, I was here when the Germans came and they gave sweets mm -hmm. and were kind to the children. And the Russians came and they killed the children and, and the mothers. And um, yeah, that sort of thing, um, that sort of behavior creates an, a determination that lasts for many, many generations. Yes. Yes. Uh, it's a shame that it could there could have been so much peaceful cooperation between the yeah. two um any anyway yeah. i i want to make, just, just make a point here um you've talked about propaganda uh, several times and i i think um we something's happened in, in the U u.s and in the uk recently where there's been a reaction against the uh, control of information by big companies uh mm -hmm. and by um, collusion between big companies and uh, and government uh, between big tech, big pharma, you know, and mm -hmm. um, the social media platforms and and the left leaning part of the government, uh, because a few people started thinking, wait a minute, um, we we are being led astray here, and and not and not that not that the conservative uh, people wouldn't do exactly the same thing, mm -hmm. <laughs> in, the, in the same position. But I yeah. think I think uh, what your the story you're telling illustrates the importance of us standing up for, for a press that is not just free, but independent 
of yes. political yes. agendas. Because with the capture of the press in the uh, in, in Russia, I refer mm -hmm. to the USSR at times, <laughs> yes. but with the capture of the, of the press, uh, it would seem when we when we hear reports and we see interviews with people that a lot of people in Russia do think that they are cleansing uh, the Ukraine of Nazis. Yes. Uh, yeah. So what, what what's your take on that? Where, where does that come from? Is is there any little kernel of truth to the idea that some Nazism is uh, so Nazi sympathies are, are, are thriving in, in the Ukraine? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I want to say that um, what Russia has chosen to do in, fight, in, in, in um, this horrific and awful war in Ukraine and the genocide, uh, you know, we are hearing this word, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Mur murdering innocent people. Yeah. There, is, there is no justification for that, no matter how righteous or unrighteous, you know, the country of Ukraine is. Um, there's nothing that could ever justify what is happening here. And, uh, and people try to look for a reason to justify it. That, well, maybe, you know, there's something happening in Ukraine that just needed to be taken care of. This, this is not that. No, this is no. horrific, awful genocide, intentional murdering of the people of Ukraine and yeah. devastation of their country. Um, having said that, absolutely, there is no Nazi... Um, you know, not, I mean, I, I just, I hear that word and I just think how ridiculous, yeah. um, is there yeah. racism in Ukraine? Yes, there is racism in Ukraine. Like there is racism in every single other country in this world. Yeah. Is there some sort of Nazi movement coming about? Well, I've lived in Ukraine for over 25 years and I have not experienced that a single time. Is there evil in Ukraine? Yes, there is. There's, there's, there's things that I wish were different here. Um, Ukraine is not a very diverse country. And so we right. have many medical students from Africa and India and Southeast Asia that come. And, and I wish that they were treated better. Yeah. Um, but I think it's just, you know, it's just, just Ukraine learning how to accept peoples from different places yeah. and yeah. how to welcome different cultures. But is there a Nazi movement here? Absolutely not. No, not and at that's, all. That's where the gospel is so important, isn't it? You know, that, that message of loving one another. You, you notice yes. there. There, there are there are no racial qualifications to that. You know, it doesn't say That's love true. people who look like you. It says That's love one true. another. You know, and even Absolutely. you know, the one thing that, that sets apart the gospel from everything, every other religion, everything that's that's uh, shared as a faith uh, setting mm -hmm. on the earth is love your enemies. Yeah, now that's hard to do, huh? Love your enemies. How how are you doing? I lost the sound here. Okay, yeah. I can I can hear you. Um, no, I lost the sound. Oh, I don't know why. Let's see. A second here. Okay. Oh, now we're back. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> okay. The thing that sets apart the message of Jesus is love your enemies. Uh, and so mm -hmm. how, how are you doing? <laughs> how are the, oh. How's the church doing? That's a, it's the most demanding of all commandments, I think. Except yes, to love, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind. Yes. Yeah. I'm so glad you asked me that question. Uh, you know, I am called to the Slavic world, and I love the Russian people. I love the Russian people as much as I love the Ukrainian people. And, um, and I, have, I have had a hard time since day one with, with making sure that when I'm speaking about the enemy, that I'm not speaking about Russian language, Russian culture, or Russian people, because I yeah. love them. Yeah. And I do with all my heart believe that not the entire population of the Russian people um, are for this war. I think there are many of them that are heartbroken from this war. And, and I wish we could hear their voices louder. Yeah. I truly yeah, do. We, we need to hear their voices louder. Um, but yes, there is an enemy. And the enemy yeah. has accomplished a great, great wound between the very close related peoples of Ukraine yeah. and Russia. And it will take an act of God to heal that wound. I cannot yeah. imagine what it will be like walking through the process of forgiveness yeah. and pain. Uh, every family in Ukraine has relatives or friends in Russia and every family in Russia has relatives and friends in Ukraine. And yet something has happened in Russia. And again, it's back to this propaganda. It's back to recognizing that the enemy has has done something in blinding people. Um, but I have many stories of close personal friends, uh, Russians, Russians who are yeah. working or serving in Ukraine, 
who've witnessed what has happened and they've called home to their moms and their brothers and sisters and, and said, this is what has happened, mom. And the, re- and the answer has been, well, that's not what they're showing on the news. Yeah. That's, yeah. What, not, that's not what they're saying here. And, and what happens when your own child calls you home and tells, tells you firsthand what they've experienced and your own mother, your own father, your own siblings don't believe you. Yeah. yeah. So that Ooh. is not a normal mm. reaction. And I think this is, again, where we need to pray that, the, that, that minds would be open, you know, the eyes would be open, that minds would see the truth. Because we know yeah. that truth will set us free, right? And, yeah. and, it, and it is, I just do believe that there is a spiritual stronghold here and that we need to pray for yeah. that. And that, that stronghold to be broken. Yeah, that passage out of Ephesians 6 about wrestling not against uh, flesh and blood, mm-hmm. but against principalities and powers. I think mm-hmm. when, when the satanic enemy is able mm-hmm. to create uh, concerted information with government and media and financial interests all saying the same mm-hmm. thing, it's yeah. very hard to counter it. And, yeah. and that's why the fight across the world... Uh, for freedom of speech is really, really mm-hmm. important. And the thing, the thing now is that media, because it's got pictures that are from today, because we are in, in effect transported we're, we're, we're to, to, to the front line, we're no longer reading about things that happened a week ago mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. it took that long to get to us, but we are seeing it, which is much more powerful. And so well-crafted propaganda well, as you've said, and you've illustrated yeah. what you've said, it can actually be more weighty than mm-hmm. people you've known and loved all your life. Yeah. It's extraordinary, isn't it? It is extraordinary. Yeah. Um, I, had, I had the opportunity uh, back in January um, to visit the Auschwitz-Birkenau uh, death camp just yeah. outside of Krakow, Poland. And it's something I'd wanted to do, um, you know, since, since the first time I came to Krakow when my children were, were young. Um, we had we had had to reposition a, a, a DTS team from Maui uh, to Poland because already things in Ukraine were starting to get heated and um, leadership had decided it was best to send them out. And so I'd come to Krakow uh, to do a little debriefing with them, bring some closure to their time with us. They'd spent almost two months in Ternopil and, and they all desired to go and see Auschwitz. And one of the things that I took away from that p- horrific place was how important it is to be truth tellers. Yeah. Because yeah. right, the not the Nazi propaganda and the Nazi, um, you know, what what they began to believe it started as a little lie. Yeah. And I right. have to believe there wasn't enough people that were able to speak the truth to them, and it yeah. grew and it grew. And where were the truth tellers? And it grew until we had to have a world war to yeah. to bring the rhetoric and and what was happening, the awful, horrific things that were happening. And so we are in another season of life, you know, where we need to be truth tellers and our media yeah. needs to be held accountable to be truth tellers because look at what's happening. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. it's, yes. it's eerie the similarities that again, it, the media could be used in such a way to brainwash people to not only believe what they're told, but not to be seekers of truth. Okay. This is what they're saying on the news, but where else mm. can I look to confirm exactly. this? Or, exactly. You know? Yeah, and if, and and we need to say too that if you're if you've already given up on the corporate media and and you, you don't you don't have trust there and you and you're going online mm-hmm. for your information, well, every time you go online, you feed your information into an algorithm that keeps giving you the same yeah. stuff. So if yeah. you are if if say and as as is true in many parts of the Western world, the, mm-hmm. the corporate media is dominated by the left, then you go yeah. online for your information, you're going to be dominated by the right. Uh, and and you've got to go uh, looking for people who have yeah. a different perspective, and grit your teeth and listen. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, sometimes you, when you true. listen to the other perspective, it's so frustrating. But, yeah. but it's important because there there there'll be bits of truth, and yeah. significance there. All right, this has been very very helpful. Now I just have one other That's big fine. question. Um, you're near the border on the Polish side. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. We we hear that a lot of people are beginning to go back. Uh, mm-hmm. Because their cities uh, now, it looks like the possibility of some of those cities in the in the central part and the and the western part are not likely to have any military action against them in the near future. So people are going mm-hmm. back home. Uh, mm-hmm. Is that what you're seeing? 
Well, I think that there is um, less refugees coming over right now. And I know we, we just, Ukraine just celebrated Easter last weekend. Yeah. So there was many, many, many people going back in um, to celebrate Easter with their families and in their communities. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know. I'm not a, I'm not a, a expert, you know, on politics and wars. And I keep hoping that this thing would stop right away, but I keep hearing that it's going to be a marathon and not a sprint. Yeah. Yeah. And I think in the marathon, there will be waves of areas, you know, that will be hit and there'll be waves of refugees that are forced to leave for their lives. And, yeah. um, Maybe right now we're in a bit of a lull and maybe right now people are feeling like it's safe to go home to some of the places where that aren't as much of a hot zone. But the reality is that Ukraine is an active war zone and anything can change at any moment. Yeah. And even for yeah. my own for my own family, you know, my my children now are 14 and 16 and they want to go home. Ukraine is their yeah. home. Ukraine is their yeah. people. They're they're here right now um, volunteering in the refugee center here in in Poland and and you know for me as their mom it's hard to imagine bringing my children into a, an area a safer area of Ukraine but where there are still missiles and bombs flying over our city yeah and so I yeah. think this is something that um that you know families families all over Ukraine um are having to having to struggle with having to come to decisions about some people have no decision left because their homes have been ruined um, other people uh, have other options, um, but we all have to. But I think, I think all of us, every Ukrainian that I have talked to, has a desire to go home and rebuild and restart. Right. You right. know, when right. it becomes safe to do so. You right. know, I, I'll just say that to my husband, Ukrainian. He told me some weeks back. He said, for the first time in his life, he feels inspired by his own people. Oh, that's and there great. is. There's That's something great. about what has happened in this war that has brought the 40 million people of Ukraine together in a way that has inspired the world, in a way that's reminded us of the value of our freedom and the value of our liberties, and that it is something worth fighting for. Yeah. And in that place, I pray that my brothers and sisters in Ukraine would seek, seek the source of true freedom, seek the source of true hope. Seek the source of true peace. And this is such an opportunity to turn our faces to the Lord. And so, Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. Well said, Sharon. Thank you for being a big hearted and articulate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we see your heart. We see that you've thought this through a lot. We see you're a biblical Christian thinker. Uh, and you thank can state you. it clearly. So thank you very, very much. And I want to say to everybody who watches this uh i think sharon's right i think this is going to go on for quite a long time mm -hmm. don't forget don't quit praying yes. uh, the grace of god has been all over so many of these people in spite of the fact that they are suffering great privations and and mm -hmm. personal sacrifices and physical difficulties yet there's something happening in the spirit that um that is quite inspirational as as sharon has said yeah. about her husband so keep praying um, don't forget, the new cycle has already yeah. left, and uh, and uh, let's not let it leave us. Okay, so yeah. thanks again, Sharon. Blessings to you and your husband. My and pleasure. Your kids. And uh, my, my pleasure. We'll get, we'll get in touch again. I would be happy to chat with you anytime. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Sharon. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye.